are talking NASCAR on Prime Sports Network. Want to thanks every uh, thank everybody for tuning in here to both Prime Sports Network and also to our new Mystery Caution YouTube channel. So uh, we are on our third week of our new format as uh, we take a look this week at Dover, the Monster Mile. How's it going, CJ? It's going great. Had a fuel mileage race at Talladega. Good times. Looking forward to the concrete and hype <laughs> over. Well, what did you think about the uh, how, how everything ended at Talladega? It, 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 there was no big crash. It, it ended like you asked it to end, uh, actually. <laughs> uh, so that was a good thing. Um, it was an interesting race. I, I, I kind of enjoyed it. <clears throat> I'm not sure that I can get behind uh, having fuel mileage races be uh, the norm at Daytona and Talladega. So I think there's got to be something done about that. Um, it was interesting to me, just the, the willingness of everybody to sit back and, and just go slowly to avoid trouble for so long. And then when we got to the end, obviously that's when everybody started to go for it. Just wish that would have happened at the stage breaks as well as kind of throughout the race more than it actually did though. Yeah, it was kind of weird, wasn't it? Uh, and Toyota, they were trying their own strategy that, <laughs> then they got screwed up, yep. which is embarrassing. But uh, yeah, it, it, it would have played out for him, right? Because the they were there and Reddick did end up winning. But how much more of a chance would they have been able to or how much of a fight would they have been able to put up at the front versus Keselowski and McDowell had that actually not had that accident actually not happened? Yeah. And, and again, it was pretty fortunate that we did at least end it under green. Uh, what did you think about Michael McDowell? Do you think he handled it well? Do you think he was trying too hard to block? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I mean, it was, um, you know, by the time he got halfway across the track from the top to the bottom, again, he should have realized that by that point there was going to be a car alongside him. Um, and I, you know, everything happens really quickly. So I, I don't begrudge him that it's the last lap, the final few hundred yards before you get to the finish and, you know, win is everything for him and for everybody. Uh, so I don't blame him for going for it, but, um, you know, probably halfway down the track, he probably should have stopped steering left at that point. And he had the fastest car. For sure. So I, I he should have just left it up to chance at that point. I mean, you got the fastest car. So if, if even if a car comes alongside of you, you just you hope that you're in a good situation. Obviously, uh, these decisions are made at such incredible speeds. And McDowell is not always used to being in this spot. But even who knows? That might have been his best chance to, to get a win this season. Um, and unfortunately it's another bad loss for him. Yeah. It would have been interesting if he would have just stayed high to see what would have happened behind because both he and Kozlowski had separated themselves from everybody else with nobody pushing. So the best Kozlowski probably could have done would have been, well, both of them probably would have been side drafting off of one another to get to the line. Uh, but you're right. I, I think, um, you know, at that point you got to just let it, let it go. Um, it ended up causing the wreck. Luckily for Keselowski, he didn't get caught up in it. Um, I think he had a chance to win clearly as well, but all his momentum was gone once McDowell was in front of him. Yeah, and Reddick, who really didn't do a whole lot of anything, uh, just benefited. He just kind of just drove, yep. parted the seas, drove right through, got the win, <laughs> stole the win, and that's what happens at Talladega. So we, we, uh, we see an awful lot of drive. Because had Reddick led any laps, do you recall? He led a total of 13 laps, and quite honestly, okay. I don't even remember when they were. Because <laughs> <Right. So. laughs> he had, it had to have been through the pit pit cycles because Toyota at that point, you know, like you said, they were going off on their own strategy, trying to <clears throat> keep all seven cars together. And it was green throughout the entire the entire race up, really up until the the later ends of the the final stage. Uh, so I think just through through the pit cycles probably was where he got those other laps like because he certainly didn't have a dominant car, but they did well to get themselves up front. Okay, this week it's uh, again Dover, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, before we do, I just want to remind everybody that if there was an F1 race, we would have been talking about F1, but we are now waiting until what's the next race? Miami next weekend. Uh, we. <laughs> 
China played out exactly as expected with the Max Verstappen win. So uh, keep your keep your score, scorecard handy. <laughs> what is that like? Thirty six out of forty four or something like that. Some weird, crazy number of wins. Yeah, I think there are only like four times that he he's failed to to win. There were what twice I think last year, once so far this year. Um, just a, a dominant car, dominant team. It was clear even with the rain disrupting qualifying uh, for the sprint race on Saturday. It was just clear once racing conditions and the dry were underway that he had something that nobody else could touch as per usual. All right, so that's uh, next week then, Miami. Next week, Miami, yep. Okay, so we'll definitely be uh, talking about that. Uh, by the way, no update on what's the latest on Christian Horner, nothing? Still in place. Um, I think there is a lot of, uh, well, there is a lot of speculation behind the scenes as to what exactly Max Verstappen's future is going to hold. Uh, I've got Audi coming into the season. My prediction about Andretti uh, coming to the series as well seems to be playing uh, out because they just opened a new shop in England to support a future Formula One team as well. Uh, so the the rumor mill is just continuing to kind of simmer. I think by the time we get to summer, we start seeing some of these moves actually happen. Uh, we'll see whether or not uh, Christian Horner comes out. Basically, Max Verstappen holds the whole key to the driver's market at this point, and I think his future is really dependent on whether Horner stays or goes. Is that why that was it? Wolf. He's the uh, owner of. Is he the owner of Mercedes? He is the uh, team principal of Mercedes, and obviously, if Max Verstappen caliber driver becomes available. When you've got Lewis Hamilton ditching you for Ferrari, you're going to do everything in your power to get Verstappen over to your side of the fence, for sure. Yeah, he's already kind of putting it in the wind, right? Now, is there is there anything, is there tampering in, in F1? Can you tamper, or is there, is he like just putting codes out there? And that's the reason why his comments are kind of, you know, kind of There's coded. They're supposed to not tamper, but they do. I mean, everybody talks to one another. You're, you're in this garage next to the guy, you know, every single weekend for the entire year. So you're going to end up talking to them. Um, I, yeah, I, I think um, there's a lot behind the scenes that we don't know. And it'd be um, it'd be silly for Total Wolf and Mercedes not to be talking to Verstappen at this point. OK, so that's next week. This week, it's just NASCAR. It's the Dover one mile racetrack and what we're going to talk about here is you've got a, a, a racetrack that um, as far as similarities you only have a few others you've got two other one mile tracks phoenix and new hampshire we haven't seen new hampshire yet this year we have seen phoenix now phoenix and new hampshire are flat tracks so they're they're the most similar if you want to talk about phoenix and new hampshire when those two races occur um but we will mention phoenix because it's a one mile track and then the other track we're going to mention is Bristol, since Bristol is concrete, just like Dover. So those are the two tracks that we're going to reference on this show, Phoenix and Bristol. Um, and by doing that, the interesting, uh, some of the interesting stats I've already noticed, uh, if you look at both of those races, Toyota, as far as Bristol, Toyota had the top two, and Gibbs, who finished outside the top ten, Led 137 laps. Actually, he was ninth, and he led 137 laps. So Toyota did really well at Bristol. Uh, at Phoenix, Toyota had the win. Christopher Bell. Ford did have three of the top five. But Toyota is definitely the manufacturer you want to be looking at heading into Dover this week. As far as starting positions, three of the last four uh, winners actually have started outside the top 15. How surprised are you about that? Very, um, you know, at a 1.0 point mile, 1 .0 mile track, you would think that uh, track position would be incredibly important. Uh, we just compared it to two tracks where track position is exceptionally important. Um, I think what it comes down to is the fact that the concrete surface is so tough. Uh, it really beats up qu equipment. The, the lap is fast. The banking is high. So I think we see incidents toward the end of the race. It tends to jumble things up. Uh, and at the same time, with this car, with the ability for teams to adjust upon it and make the adjustments that they need, unlike the old car, those caution periods give them the opportunity to make those adjustments and move up through the field, which is why we've seen three out of the last four uh, win from outside of the top 15. 
Uh, the other winner started fourth during that stretch. Uh, Ford has just got one win in the last eight at Dover. Um, and how about this? Speaking of starting positions, there has not been a pole sitter win at Dover since Jimmy Johnson in 2010. That's over the last 23. How crazy is that? No pole sitter at a one mile been- track. Very interesting, especially considering you've got one, two, three, four, five front row. Seven. Front Seven siblings. since 2010. There you go. So, yeah. So, pole, no. Second, yes. Okay. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Uh, the farthest back a winner uh, won was back in 1995, and it was the one and only Kyle Petty. Hmm. How many races did Kyle Petty win? Just a handful. A yeah. couple. So, three or wow. three, maybe. 37th. Uh, other positions have been 27th, 26th, 24th, 22nd. Uh, so keep that in mind. And we'll talk more about that on Mystery Caution on Saturday when we do our qualifying uh, update where we're going to talk a little bit about what happened uh, at qualifying. We'll go over the practice speeds and the qualifying uh, uh, positions, of course, and remind everybody about uh, what we just talked about here and how that might impact uh, our handicapping going into the race the next day. Okay, so let's take a look at the odds. First of all, uh, championship odds. Let's just uh, take a look at what's going on here. Uh, You've got uh, Byron, Larson, and Hamlin are all sitting there at five to one. So the numbers are pretty decent at this point. We don't have anything crazy low. And that's just because there's so many possible champions uh, and everybody kind of looks like it's anything's possible at this point. Elliot's still nine. Truex is still nine. That's not bad. And Blaney's 12. And then after that, as you can see, uh, actually, let me pop that up for you. Uh, There's, uh, uh, as usual, you have a lot of uh, pretty decent uh, numbers here. You know, Reddick just won. Chastain, who, who I think is still a good bargain, or I think is still somebody to keep an eye on. Uh, Logano, uh, if Kyle Bush can get things going, Busher, Kozlowski. So, yeah, what do you make about uh, any of these bargains if you were wagering right now that you would take a stab at? Logano. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, what is that? 16? 16. 16. Yep. You know, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's great considering how fast he's been all season, just hasn't had the luck to go with it. All they have to do is close out a race. They're going to get a win at some point. And I think that then opens up the seal and they go on a run. Uh, Momentum is everything in this sport. They haven't had much on their side. So I think if anybody can turn it around or is poised to turn it around, uh, Logano Blaney actually looks pretty good at 12 there too. Yeah. He has uh, stayed at that number pretty much all season after getting off to a good start all right so we've got the worth 400 here are the odds that we're throwing in there kyle larson being at four to one i'm i'm kind of surprised in a little bit a little little way he's become and it's and i know he's got a championship but he's kind of become like the 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 number one driver as far as he's the guy that's going to get all the benefit of the doubt when it comes to on a weekly basis outside of course of the super speedways or the well yeah or the road courses but mostly the super speedways he's the guy that is going to get the benefit of the doubt as always being the favorite yeah um and since we're talking about kyle's i'll go back i I shorted kyle petty by a few He, he won eight Uh, But anyway, on the topic of Kyle Larson, the reason why he's getting it here at Dover, um, you know, 32nd last year, not good at all. Um, But he's got the best average finish of um, the active drivers at this track, 8.6 across 15 starts at the track. Yeah, he only has one win, uh, but he does have seven top fives and 11 top tens. He led 263 laps in the spring race in 2021. He led 154 laps in the fall race of 2019. Um, so he's had a couple races here, probably like four or five, where he's led a uh, hundred or, or more laps, um, and he's got the best average finish. So while Larson hasn't had a whole heck of a lot of consistency this season, which is why he's not further up the 
the the charts in terms of the actual points themselves uh, Dover is a place where he has shown consistency in the past. The question is just whether or not, like you started out, is he going to be able to compete against the Toyotas? And I, th I think if there's anybody that can, it's going to be somebody from the Hendrick stable. So why not Larson? Yeah, you see, the thing, uh, I guess the point I want to make is, is that, and we'll get into it, of course, is that I think that, you know, when you're talking about uh, Truex, Byron, uh, Hamlin, Bell, uh, Elliott, I mean, the, to me... I see very similar stats that tell me that they're every bit is should be every bit as competitive as Larson in this race, but because Kyle Larson's Kyle Larson, he's he's just always going to be the favorite, even if his stats look equal to everybody else. Um, and because look, I could, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead because we talk about the fact that it's it's hard taking these drivers at four to one, and 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 so you always want to find the warts. Well, here are the warts. Last two finishes, 21st. Um, finishes at Phoenix and Bristol, 5th and 14th. That's nothing special. Last two races with the new car, 32nd and 6th. Let it combine 19 laps. I'm not seeing a whole lot to tell me that Kyle Larson should be 4-1 to one compared to the other, other drivers. Yeah, I don't disagree with you one bit. Um, the warts on the others, uh, certainly from a Truex perspective, is going to be kind of where has he been so far this season? He's probably had one or two races where he's been competitive enough to win, um, just hasn't been able to pull it through. He started 17th at, at Dover last year, but ended up leading 68 laps and winning. And you look at the laps led, he's consistently at the front regardless of where he starts here. Um, so, I, I mean, 132, 15, 8, 88, 0, 16, 5, and 68 out of laps led out of his last seven races here at this track. And that's... <clears throat> You know, starts of 13th, 19th, 18th, 17th, and a couple within the top five as well. Uh, so uh, Truex is very consistent, like I said, with Larson here at this track. If there's a place that he can get it done, uh, certainly he could be. This could be the, the second time or maybe third time this season where he's competitive enough to win a race. I think uh, winning back-to-back -back races, so defending the race win that he had last year, obviously a little bit harder to do. Uh, but that, that would be the warts that you've got there on Truex. And keep in mind that even last year, Truex was off off to a slow start. And what was his first win? Was this race? So once again, it's not like he's a. Uh, I mean, he's, he's he's having a solid start, of course, better than last year. But the point is, is that um, I think because of the odds sitting there, you're getting a couple of extra points. Uh, he's the defending champ, yes, but I think I look at that as a, as a positive because if Kyle Larson was defending champ, his odds would probably be a little bit uh, lower. Uh, also, throw in the fact that Truex was seventh at Phoenix, second at Bristol, so he was a lot better on these concrete tracks uh, than uh, than Larson was. Uh, and uh, let's remember the Phoenix uh, race when he finished seventh. Uh, that was a race where it was really based. I, I believe it was a, it was a pit stop situation. He didn't get a break. He had to pit. He came back, and if there was like another caution, I think he would have had a really good chance to win the race. If there would have been a few extra laps, all that kind of stuff. Um, and he did lead fifty five laps in that race, and then would lead fifty four laps in the in the second place finish uh, over in Bristol. So. Uh, that's why I think Truex uh, is a really solid play here and uh, why I think, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's in a better situation uh, also based on the odds. I mean, you're getting six to one versus four to one. Not a big deal, but definitely enough for me to say that Martin Truex Jr. is ready uh, to go out and get his first win of the season. Okay, so now we take a look at a few of the other Chevys that are in uh, – the same odds range as Truex, um, but I'm a little bit surprised actually that Byron's seven and Elliott's eleven. So that, that surprised me a little bit that you're getting four extra points on Elliott. Um, he's won here uh, just recently, so he's got two wins. Um, he, he's always raced here well. He's got nine top fives out of thirteen. I mean, that's really impressive. I know Byron had a big result last year. I get it. He led 193 laps and finished fourth. Before that, he hadn't really done much. He had a few top fives. That was it. Um, 
but the other thing is is that Byron has not looked good at Phoenix or Bristol. Elliot I'm willing to be a little bit more forgiving because he was trying to figure the car out. And now he's a lot better. So I'm not saying Elliot should be ahead of Byron here. I'm just a little bit surprised you're getting eleven to one on Elliot as opposed to seven to one on Byron. Yeah, I think uh, Byron's getting the momentum boost here um, because he's been the hottest driver so far this season. You know, aside from Denny Hamlin, perhaps. Um, so, so Byron with the with the tons of laps led last year, very good result. Uh, finally, perhaps figuring out this track, and then you add in the momentum that he's had early in 2024. I think there's still probably people that are on the fence from the Chase Elliott slump, and he's figured it out for sure. He's definitely getting much better results than he has for the past probably year and a half at this point. Uh, win at, uh, in 2022 at the track, finished 11th, which, was, which wasn't bad last year when he was in the midst of his slump, for sure. Um, so I think um, it is interesting, but Byron's probably riding 2024 momentum. Okay, and then uh, we see Chastain and Hamlin. See, in my mind, I think Hamlin should be the favorite of this race, or at least co-favorite. Uh, he has very good history here. I know he's only won once. But overall, it's a good history. It's it's not elite, you know. Like matter of fact, if you like look at Truex, who is my top pick, uh, he's he's been more impressive than Hamlin. But Hamlin has a has a good history. Uh, and more important is that he looks really really good on these concrete tracks so far this year. Which remember that even though when he finished eleventh at Phoenix, he got a little impatient there racing Chastain late and got into him totally ruined his day uh, led 68 laps probably should have won or finished second um and then came back in bristol and led 163 laps and won so i really and and hamlin's having a strong start to the season so yeah i, I think hamlin uh should at least be a co-favorite to truex uh or um uh, maybe even the overall favorite based on the start he's having this year, which is better than Truex. Um, but, uh, hey, I'm going to try to take advantage of that. Yeah, I think if uh, anybody's, you know, looking for any kind of value, Hamlin certainly offers it um, just by virtue of what he did at Bristol. Uh, it's funny that he he and Chastain had another run in, <laughs> but that's beside the point. Well, they got to they got to stay away from each other on the track. But um, that goes back a long way. But yeah, Hamlin um, he's only got one win here, but he's led laps like Truex has in five of the last six here at Dover, and a, a lot of laps. Quite quite honestly, um, he's got that win. He finished fifth in in last year's race. I do agree. I, I'm surprised that Hamlin's not in your top three in terms of the favorites. And then Chastain's been really, really good here recently, too. I mean, third and second in, in the last two races, and he has led 86 and 98 laps in both of those. So um, I do think Hamlin should be up in the top three. I think uh, Ross Chastain is is another, probably, honestly, should probably be getting better odds than, than maybe even Byron. Yeah, I, I will say this, though, is that, let's keep in mind, Chastain has one top five on the year. Um and 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 the, and the other negative is he didn't really perform all that well uh, at Bristol. He was okay at Phoenix. Um, so when I take a look at all the positives which you mentioned, and including the fact, by the way, in his last two Xfinity series starts, he finished second and third. So that's his last two Xfinity series starts, and his last two Cup series starts were second and third, as you mentioned. So. There's a lot of positives, but to seven to one, that's what takes me away from it. I wanted him at nine to one or ten to one, and thought at that price I was gonna. Oh, I'm gonna. I like Chastain, but at seven to one, that's what backs me off. I guess I'm operating the bank side, right? So from a payout perspective, <laughs> I want more people to lose. Therefore, I would have put Chastain's odds higher just because of that recent momentum at this track. You're right. Um, from a, you know, Byron's getting the momentum from 2024. Chastain is not. I think Chastain's got a better record at the track, um, even with Byron's dominant, uh, even though he didn't win, uh, performance last year. Because uh, this is actually the next driver is really where I thought I was going to get Chastain, which is why I really like Christopher Bell, because we're getting 10 to 1 on Bell. So that's the odds I want on a driver that, with a new car, finished 6th and 4th, won Phoenix uh, this year, uh, top 10 at Bristol, and in the Xfinity series, 
Uh, his four races. One, the one race he had carburetor issues. The other three, all in the top five with two wins. So this is a really good track for Christopher Bell. And because of that, you know, the one thing is he hasn't raced all that great the last several races. So he's in a little bit of a rut, that kind of deal. Um, but I'm willing to take that considering I'm getting 10 to 1 on a driver that goes to a track that he really likes. Yeah, I, Bell was somebody who was on my mind for this uh, race prior to, you know, seeing the odds and all that good stuff, as was Hamlin. Uh, and when you look at his his Bristol's result, still a, a top 10 there, like you said. So a lot of top 10s um, to start off the season kind of trailed off here in the last three races. He could really use some good result this weekend to turn things back around for himself. Fourth and sixth in his last two here. He did start second last year. That's the magic spot, apparently, but I didn't convert that into a win. Um, I, I think... Um, I do like Bell quite a bit this weekend at Dover. All right. And then you've got Blaney at 13, Gibbs and Bowman at 16. Now, Blaney, I, I, I think the odds are fine. Uh, if they were any less, I would ignore it. If I, I was actually hoping for a little bit better, but 13 is okay if you're looking for a, you know, a middling kind of uh, long shot uh, play. But and, and that's only because Blaney has just been – I mean, he doesn't have a great history here, but – what I'm really looking at is the fact that last year, his most recent, he finished third, which was his best finish. Uh, he also has demonstrated um, that he could be very good at Phoenix, and he finished fifth earlier this year. Um, he can be good at Bristol, um, but has had uh, maybe his results just uh, haven't uh, picked up with the fact that sooner or later he's going to win there. And in his last four Xfinity Series races at Dover, He's finished first, second, fourth, and fourth. So uh, this is also a pretty decent track for him, but it's finally starting to pick up in cup. Um, it's just a, a number that's a little bit, uh, you know, it's, I'm on the fence with the number. Yeah. Um, from a Bowman perspective, um, I like I said at the beginning, I think if there's any group that can challenge the the joe gibbs toyotas um I'm, I'm taking bowman certainly before i i go with elliot um from a blaney perspective uh kind of middle of the road um he has the he has potential but he's just not impressing me here at dover um so i'm probably i'm, I'm gonna avoid him for that reason you know he's gonna ha kind of have to turn turn around his um dover performances in order to to make me want to go for him certainly at that number I, I do think it's about right, but again, nothing special, especially when I can get, get Bowman there uh, for a little bit better as well. And if yes. you want to flyer Gibbs, I mean, the Joe Gibbs Toyotas have been very strong. Uh, Gibbs is a very strong driver. So when is he actually going to take advantage of that equi equipment and put it into victory lane? You got uh, your teammates winning on both of the like tracks at, at, on the series or on the calendar so far this season. Uh, so can he come from his 13th position uh, in this race last year, he started 24th, so he worked his way forward. That's that's a really good result. Um, of the of the three there, certainly I would go with Bowman. Gibbs would be next, and then Blaney would be third. Yeah, I definitely. I mean, I would have preferred Blaney at 16 to one with Gibbs and Bowman, uh, but I I didn't get it, which is why I agree. I think Gibbs and Bowman are can't uh, miss uh, the kind of middle long shot plays. Um, Bowman, five top fives, a runner-up and a win in his last six. Didn't have, of course, uh, an opportunity to race here last year. Uh, fourth at Bristol. And then you, and of course, one here in 2021. And then um, Gibbs, as you said, uh, the Toyota. Uh, even though he doesn't have a top 10 in his last four races this year, he was third at Phoenix, led 57 laps, and was a very strong uh, ninth at Bristol, leading 137 laps that I mentioned before. Um, has two top fives and two Xfinity series starts here as well. So I, I agree. I think Gibbs and Bowman, you have to play these uh, drivers at 16 to 1. Uh, then you have Reddick and Kyle at 19 to 1. Uh, Reddick got his win last week. And considering the fact that he doesn't have a top five here over his five starts and he's never let a lap here, um, and he really didn't have any great results in the uh, concrete races this year so far, um, he's a pass. Um, Kyle still needs to be a pass based on the fact that uh, he hasn't gotten out of his rut yet. 
Um, so this is one of those races that I think is going to be important for him because he's had a, a lot of really good uh, runs here over his career. Um, but out of 13 top fives and 35 career races, he only has one since his 2017 win. And he has not finished inside the top 20 or in the top 20 in either concrete race excuse me, either the concrete Bristol race or the one mile race at Phoenix. Yeah. Very interesting there. Um, I agree with you on all fronts. I think um, Reddick just hasn't shown it. Um, he, he snuck in to the victory. Like you said, last week, it's also extremely hard to win back to back races. So having the momentum that he has uh, winning back to back weeks, um, it's going to be a tall order, especially considering his performance on these types of tracks earlier this season. And like you said, Kyle Busch is a is a hard pass right now. If there was any place that Bush in a Richard Childress racing car should have excelled, it should have been Talladega. It looked like it was shaping up to be that way when he qualified uh, quite well for the weekend, but then in the race basically showed nothing. He got stage points in one of the segments and then uh, led a handful of laps and finished way down the order. So I think his woes continue. Richard Childress racing, Austin Dillon fell into the same category last week. I think they, as an organization, still have a long road to go before we start choosing them again. The only good thing about Kyle, if you want to take a look at it, uh, coming into this race is the based on his history at this track is that last year he won the pole um but finished a disappointing 21st um and then in the 2022 race he led 103 laps so in the two races with the new car he had impressive runs both years still uh didn't finish in the top five in either race okay uh next up we have joey logano uh, chris busher and Brad Kozlowski between 20 and 22 to 1. Now, Logano is going to be a pass for me. Didn't race well at Phoenix or Bristol. Hasn't raced well either um, uh, if you look at uh, the last couple of races here. Um, and by the way, he only has led 41 career laps in 27 races. That's pretty bad. But Busher and Kozlowski, I'm playing both of them. Uh, Busher, uh, we're getting, and the long shot numbers are pretty good, but Busher, um, hadn't, did not have a good history here, but the last two races, both top tens, take a look at his last four starting positions in this race, fifth, first, 10th, and fifth. That's an average of uh, basically fifth. So he started, uh, fifth on an average in the last four races here in four Xfinity series races. He has an average finish of sixth. With a win in 2015, he finished second at Phoenix, seventh at Bristol. Kozlowski I like even better. Uh, how can you not, based on the fact that he's been runner-up in his last two races, and he was fourth at Phoenix, third at Bristol. Now, he doesn't have a great resume here, even though he does have a win. Um, and he's only led 17 laps in his last six races. But this year, with the new car the new team maybe he's just going to be better than he was with Penske it's 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 kind of it's kind of uh it looks like it's shaping up to maybe finally be the week that Brad Keselowski gets a win that would be awesome it'd be a long time coming um I, I agree I, I was I was excited for Keselowski to come to this track because I thought he could um emulate the win that he had back in 2012 that was a long time ago he did start on pole in 2016 but like you said he's only led 17 laps here over the past um five or six races however you know he's been learning he's, he's taken a step forward since last season you know busher figured it out like you said the last two races at this track busher had great results i i think it's wise to take him again this year i think he's going to have another top 10 may even be in there for in the mix for the win but the real improvement from year to year has not been busher he's stayed kind of steady it's been keselowski i think keselowski has been closer to a win uh this year than he has been even last year and he was pretty close a couple of times last year as well and specifically at these types of tracks this this type of track in particular really plays to the rfk racing uh strengths the concrete hard surface where they really maximize their their tire wear um or minimize i should say their their tire wear they can maximize their grip throughout the throughout the run 
as well as just the fact that they've been performing well on the high bank, sh shorter types of ovals uh, recently too. So I like both of them. I, I you know, I think either one of them could win. Um, I'd pro my heart wants to say Kozlowski, but my head is going to say I'd go with Busher, then Kozlowski, then Logano. All right. And now as we get to the long shots, um, the most interesting long shots. And by the way, Eric Jones is not racing this week. Um, Correct. What's Broken the vertebrae. Okay. Broken vertebrae just came out today. So unfortunately, his crash um, at Talladega, which is a hard one, uh, head on into the wall. He said he felt back pain when they took him to the infield care center. So he ended up taking him to the hospital. He was released, but later diagnosed with a uh, fractured vertebrae. So he's at least out this week. Okay. So uh, the top long shots I'm looking at, or, or deep long shots, there would be three of them, would be Wallace at 30 to 1 and Briscoe and Berry at 55 to 1. Uh, Wallace has actually been getting incrementally better here. If you take a look at it, in his first eight races at Dover, he had an average finish of 23.8. In his last three, he has an average finish of 13th. And also, in the Xfinity series, he had an average of 10.2, which is pretty good, including two poles and a runner-up. So this has been a pretty good track for Wallace over his career, and he's just, especially in the Xfinity series, and now he's finally starting to pick it up in the Cup series, even though he's never had a top 10, and he's never led a lap. Uh, Briscoe, I just like the odds. That's basically all that is. I like the fact that he's off to a better start this year. He's also had very good success here in Xfinity Series. He's been okay at Phoenix and Bristol. And Berry is just one of those, well, look, it's his first cup race, I believe, here. Um, and that's just going to be really tough. And he's not going to win his first cup race at Dover. It's to be really, that's why he's 55 to 1, though. Because if you take a look at his three Xfinity Series results, you can't get much better than first, second, and second. So that's the reason why I would just, you know, if you want to throw a buck or two on these three drivers, okay. Even though I, I won't expect any uh, any of them to win. But, you know, because Dover, as hard as a track it is, it just shows you that it's a very, it, it's the drivers, you, you got to have experience here. Yeah, I think experience certainly plays into it at a track like this. But, um, you know, Xfinity experience counts as well. And yep. we saw Barry step into uh, Martinsville with uh, Chase Elliott's car and do quite well. And he did well there earlier this season as well. Uh, so second, first, second, like you said, in his X three Xfinity starts, just it doesn't get much better than that. Um, he and Briscoe, certainly of the long shots that we've got out here, would be the two that I would take and more so on Barry's side than Briscoe. Uh, but both on the same team, both with uh, similar equipment, both should have uh, pretty good days, I would think. And the only other uh, n drivers I wanted to uh, throw out there, just uh, stats-wise, Sindrick, um, not good in the two cup races, but seven Xfinity Series races. His average finish is 4.6 with a win. Suarez, if you take a look, you go, wow, five top tens out of 11. That's good for Suarez. But consider this, in his first six appearances, he had an average of 8.6. His last five appearances, 23.2. So not so good. Um, and uh, that's pretty much going to wrap up uh, from what I see as far as any, because again, it's not going to be the long shots at Dover. It just doesn't happen very often. Nope. Totally agree. Um, like I said, uh, Briscoe and, and Barry Briscoe's back to kind of where he was at the beginning part of last season before that penalty ended up really tanking their season. He started to come back a little toward the end last year. Uh, but I, I, you know, of, of the Fords, I don't think it's going to be a Penske day. I think it'll be a Stuart Haas leading the way kind of day. Um, aside from RFK, um, I think uh, Keselowski and Bush certainly have the upper hand. Um, but of the long shots, I, I would still stick with Barry and Briscoe. Okay, so top three, I'm going to go with Truex, Hamlin, and Bell. Um, and, I, and again, I, the other drivers that I definitely like are going to be Gibbs, Bowman, Busher, and Keselowski. Uh, what about you? Hamlin, Byron, and Truex for me at the top. Um, in the middle, I'm thinking Keselowski and Busher. And I will go with Barry as my long shot. Yeah. That's, uh, please find out if you know, qualifying is, 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 will definitely help. Um, won't tell us everything, but it'll definitely help. Okay, so next week, is that Kansas? 
Next week is Kansas, yep. And we do not have a break until the Olympics, correct? Yeah. That's when we take two weeks off? This this schedule this year goes straight on through. Yeah, um, not until scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Uh, Yeah, basically, do we even have one? When when is the Olympic break? Is it June? It's like July. It's July. 7th, 14th, 21. Yeah, so it's between 21st of July, end of July, July 21st, and then we got uh, two weeks off, and so we hit August 11th. So that'll be between Indianapolis and Richmond. And then that's it. That's the only break of the season, right? Yep. They used to take off Easter. Remember that? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I don't think anybody was real happy with what happened this year. That's for sure. (laughs) All right. So there you go. Uh, That is going to do it for the Worth 400 preview. Uh, Again, next week we'll talk F1. We'll talk Kansas. Uh, We will also um, uh, talk F1 uh, with the race in Miami. (laughs) Uh, with uh, uh, with uh, Max Verstappen uh, looking to win again, so uh, that's Ferrari good. will Ferrari will have a new uh, livery for Miami, special for the North American round. They're going to have some blue on their car. That's <laughs> that was unpredictable. While well, you got Max Verstappen, you know, winning every single race, and the the series becomes ultra predictable. Um, maybe you start betting on the car colors. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever you can make money on. By the way, didn't we have a what was that uh, long shot play that we had last time out? Uh, well, last week, yeah, the one where we talked about uh, a driver if he finished in the top ten was eight to one. I forget which driver it was. Alonzo, wasn't it? Was that okay? Maybe that was it. <laughs> I think it was Alonzo, and yeah, he had a really great weekend. I very, very strong. Yeah, um, let's see, where did he finish? He was up there. Um, I actually closed my F one results. Let's see here, real quickly. He had a great sprint race, uh, and then that kind of carried over into his qualifying for the race on Sunday. Um, he was a little bit underpaced when the race actually got going. Uh, but he ended up finishing seventh. So oh. started third. He qualified third. Had a great, great qualifying effort. Like I said, that carried over from a very strong sprint race on Saturday. Uh, but ended up finishing seventh, well inside the points there. So there we go. We we hit it. We hit the eight to one shot. We found a way <laughs> to make money in F one. And I don't know why that was like crazy pricing because it's almost uh, like a given that that Alonso is going to finish well inside there. Um, so that was definitely one to take advantage of. And those who did, uh, congratulations. Well, we'll, we'll try to figure out another way, uh, to make some money, uh, outside of whoever's going to win the race since that's pretty academic every <laughs> week or every race. All right. Yeah. So again, next week we'll be back, uh, every, every Tuesday. Uh, that's the plan to record these uh, previews here for NASCAR. And whenever there's an F1 race, I will return on Saturday on mystery caution, and that's why you want to subscribe to both channels and uh, you can check us out again. Same thing happened. I recorded the show. It took about five hours to upload, unfortunately. So it did not post until about eight o'clock at night on Saturday night. But hey, that's not my fault. I'm, I'm done early enough after qualifying. So just got to wait for those uploads to come through. But Saturday night at the latest, you can check out Mystery Caution for our update of the race each week. And that, of course, means Dover. Uh, for Saturday. Um, that's it. CJ, appreciate it as always. And again, on Saturday, I will be able to uh, also uh, update everybody with the link to your report at Rotowire. You got it. I'll have that out on Friday, post it under the video, and everybody enjoyed over. Absolutely. And we'll see everybody next week. <laughs>